If you and I are to be instruments of the healing of the world, it is that we are quiet enough to hear our Dharma, our way, and that we live our way as a statement. As Gandhi said, my life is my message. We live our lives in such a way that the way you are in the supermarket, the way you are with your loved ones, the way you are when you're facing pain, it is all part of the deepest wisdom statement you are able to make. It is the truth of your deepest being. For that, you have to listen inward very quietly as you're offering to all beings. Welcome to another Ramdas Here and Now episode. I'm your host, Jackie Dobrinska, and you, you are the Ramdas community, folks with compasses pointed towards consciousness. Thank you for tuning in. This is episode 230. It was recorded in 1992 in Monterey, California, and it's a continuation from the last episode we aired. Um, in that first episode, in the beginning, Ramdas talked about how he was nursing a cold. And just in case you didn't listen to that, I wanted to let you know because you can kind of hear it in his voice. It's a little bit lower than normal. Um, we probably all have a favorite Ramdas quote or saying. I have lots of them. You probably do too, actually. Um, but one of mine is his response he often gives when someone asks about how do we share our excitement and passion about these teaching with others. And he says something to the effect of, all you can do is become an environment. So when another person is ready, they can come up for air. Um, and it's sort of reminding us that we all have to do our own work. We all have to face our suffering and our pain and our negative voices and our hypocrisies, um, as well as embrace our light and our joy and our divinity um, so that we can stop projecting onto each other and that we can all sort of come into this awakening. And that as we do that inner work, we can't forget the other, um, that we don't get lost in the me, but remember we're part of this bigger family. And I share that because, to me, a lot of this lecture you're about to listen to encompasses a lot of that. You know, we all suffer. We all carry our measure of tear and sorrows. Um, we all create suffering from our own shadows. Uh, we're all trying to do our best. We're all trying to do good. We all have parts that hurt and are in pain and that we want to protect. Um, we're all trying to really come from our heart in so many ways. And at the same time, have boundaries that might keep us safe and out of harm's way. Um, so we're all in this delicate dance and balance. And as a result, we're all going to have some hypocrisies that we're working through. Sometimes we're just totally blind to them. Um, and sometimes we have nudges around our awareness and we try to hide from them a little bit, sort of like assuaging our guilt um, by recycling instead of actually changing our behaviors. But in this talk, um, he sort of reminds us that there's two things to find our way through, two things we need. We need a big dose of trust um, to really recognize that there are, there's something going on that's so much bigger than we can possibly understand, that our intellect just doesn't quite grok it, and to listen deeply to our unique gifts. What is yours to give, whether that is sending out emails for an NGO or raising a child with love? like. None of them are better than others. They're all just contributing to this well of compassion. Um, but more than likely, you're going to hear something even more different, nuanced than what I just shared. And we want to bring that all together. We all hold a piece of the whole, right? And so we come together to share about every other week. Um, and the next gathering is via Zoom, and it's on July 25th, and we'll, we'll discuss this and the previous episode together. So sign up to get invitations. You just go to ramdas.org slash fellowship. 
Um, I also want you to know about this really awesome collaboration that just happened and was released through Solan Records. It's um, with David Starfire, who, if you don't know, is this beloved global bass music producer, um, and Ramdas. It's an EP, and it's called Alchemy of the Heart, and it features this, you know, transcendent electronic underscore, and then it has these bidur- binaural beats, which help us get into sort of theta state, which is what meditation does. Um, and then this great mesmerizing instrumentation, and then those lovely heartfelt words by Ramdas. It was recently featured at the MAPS conference. Um, it's a psychedelic conference in Denver, Colorado. And, you know, part of what it does is just create this atmosphere, this environment of a serenity and spaciousness so that we can get into these meditative states and return to that really lovely sacred heart space. As we know, there's lots of tools to get into that space. Um, and another one, another way to calm your nervous system is through this little device I mentioned a few weeks ago called Apollo Nero Wearable. Um, there are some clinical trials, one at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, where it worked with both, both experienced and novice meditators. And it showed that it was much easier to get into those states when you use this device. That um, One of the results was that novice meditators were able to access med- meditative states 50% faster on average than they did without using the device. So it just uses sort of simple vibration um, to help your body relax and reduce feelings of stress, which, as we all know, is the first step in getting into meditative states. So you can get $40 off your purchase today by using the code BEHERENOW uh, by going to apollonero.com. That's A-P-O-L-L-O-N-E-U-R-O.com. And as always, we thank our sponsors for without them, we could not consistently be bringing you these amazing lectures. Um, And we also couldn't do it without you, both you as a listener and you as a donor. So if you don't already, please consider giving by going to ramdas.org slash donate. We hope that you are nourished well by this episode and these teachings. And as always, whatever good may come from them, may it benefit us in our daily lives and ripple out into the world for the benefit of all beings. So here is Ramdas, here and now. Namaste and blessings. I've told this story so many times, it's so vivid. I was teaching the same kind of course I taught in Oakland, in New York. This is a course where everybody in the class goes out and does volunteer work, and then we have an open mic, and we all get involved. We learn how to express the compassion in our hearts. And this woman in New York said, I live in an apartment, and every day I go to work, and I go by the corner of the street, and for the past eight months, this has been this man standing there with a paper cup with some coins in it jiggling. She said he's a homeless man. And she said, now and then I give him some money. Then there was a silence and she looked a little embarrassed and she said, actually, he's been there so long I worked out a budget. She said, I give him 250 a week. I mean, he's the local homeless man. And you just, and she just, I do it in a random way though. <laughs> she said, but as a result of taking this course, I realized that though I saw him all the time, that I had never acknowledged his existence as a fellow human being. She said, I asked myself, why was that? And she realized she was afraid. She thought, what am I afraid of? Not afraid he's going to rape me. Not afraid he's going to steal my pocketbook. And she sat with it and she said, I realized that I was afraid that if I acknowledged him as a fellow human being, he'd end up living in my living room. How would I set the boundaries? That was the issue. How would you set the boundaries? Because the nature of the human heart is that it doesn't know boundaries. That's the nature of love. When you're in love with somebody, you want to take it. You want my money. You want What do you want? My time? What? You want breakfast in bed? Of course. You want my life? Go ahead. The mind, on the other hand, the analytic mind, which is the instrument of power of your separateness, is saying, hey, now, wait a minute. 
cool it. I have health insurance to pay. You can't give away everything. I mean, great, this lilies of the field business, but don't include me. And in an interesting way, it's a tension within one between one's mind, which is protecting your separateness, and your heart, which is constantly going out and merging into all of it. And it's far out that in our culture, we end up experiencing our hearts as our enemy because the amount of suffering means that if we keep our heart open, we're going to lose. We're going to have to surrender into it, and we will lose everything we think we are. How painful to live a life in which one's afraid of one's own heart. Now, you and I both understand that the issue is the issue of boundaries, of understanding what your unique way is in the world. What is your unique dharma, your unique path to honor your uniqueness and then honor what it is that you have to keep together in order to live that one out? And when you are clear in that, when your mind is quiet enough so that you can hear what your part is in the whole picture, you're able to say no in the same way you say yes without closing your heart. And if you look inside yourself, watch how, just watch for a while, how every time you have to say no to somebody and don't give them what they want, what happens, how you close down just a little bit to protect yourself because part of you is empathizing with them and it hurts to have no said to you. And the other part of you knows that when you say no to somebody, they might get angry at you and you don't want to feel that anger. So you close down to protect yourself. So you say no, as opposed to yes. <laughs> I learned from my guru in India, Neem Karoli Baba, who the word he used most frequently was jao, J-A-O, which means split, go, get lost, leave, bye-bye. You know, and you'd come to your guru, you know, it's a big deal. You bring flowers, you bring fruit, you fall on your face, you're there, you know, this is the, this is the being. And he pulls your beard and he looks at you and you're all set. You've just come from America come home to your girl and he looks at you and he says, Ciao. Go? I just came. He's the opposite of gurus that collect you. And it took me a long time to get over taking the Jiao personally. You know, he's really telling me to go. He's just saying, let's process, keep going. <laughs> Don't collect it. Yeah. It's everywhere. What are you doing in here? <laughs> I mean, that's far out. That's a good teacher. He got me to love the term Jao because it was like a love affair. He was saying, I love you. It's okay to go. Go, go with my blessings. Jao. Imagine the word of endearment is split. Go, I love you. He was so far out that in all the years I knew him, I could never find him because there were so many planes of consciousness. You never knew which one he was on. And every time you thought I got him, he wasn't there. I knew he knew everything. That was a real far out experience because he showed me he knew everything. If any of you have read Miracle of Love, which is a book of a thousand stories I did about him, you know all these stories, but the story that I've told many years ago, uh, I was with these women and this group of people that went to a temple for the day and we couldn't come to see him until the afternoon. And I had a Volkswagen microbus and on the way back, the bus wouldn't go up a hill because it was only running on three cylinders. So I said to everybody, get out and push. And everybody got out but these two women who were having a conversation, and they just ignored me. So the rest of us pushed the car up the hill. All the time I'm thinking, why aren't they getting out and pushing? Were they so special? I didn't say anything, though, and I got back in the car, and we drove to the temple, and we walked to the temple, and I, I was a perfect gentleman. Walking to the temple, and Maharaji screaming from across the, across the courtyard, Ram Dass is angry, Ram Dass is angry. And they said, no, he's been very nice. No, he's angry that women wouldn't get out and push. See? See? So, um, living around somebody like that, I mean, you can't go in the bathroom and lock the door. You know, there it's, all, it's all out. And when you find that somebody loves you in spite of yourself, I mean, that's, then you begin to taste what unconditional love is. Because most people say, sure, you love me, but if you really knew. But see, he does, and he still does. So there you are. So... 
So being around him is an incredible, uh, just far out to just be around somebody like that who's nobody, you know. This is a, a book that came out after uh, Miracle of Love. It's called By His Grace. And this is the oldest Indian devotee. His story is about being with Maharaji. And he was a chairman of the economics department at Allahabad University. It's fun to watch an economist have his mind blown. <laughs> it's a very honest book. And often when I go to India, I uh, go to visit this uh, man who's very, he's in his 70s. I was going to say he's very old, but <laughs> I keep having to reassess those words, you know. Just let me give you a little feeling of what those moments are like, because that's where teachings happen so deeply. We sit with our cups of sweet tea, watching the shadows lengthen, the colors dissolving into darkness. We see each other silhouetted against the last light, and then it is just our disembodied voices that appear to float in a blackness, punctuated now and then by the striking of a match or the glow of Dada's cigarette. Dada is the Indian devotee. The conversation is quiet, the silence often conveying more than the words. We are savoring stories about our guru, Neem Karoli Baba, Maharaji, or Baba, as his devotees call him. How he came into each of our lives. How our lives were changed by knowing him. What good samskaras allowed us to be in the presence of such a being. We compare notes, report incidents in minute detail, struggle to find expression for our feelings about him. Each new story is an invitation to enter more deeply into the mystery. For us, he represents enlightenment, freedom, God, Ram, Hanuman, Krishna, Shiva, the play of form, compassion itself, a beloved and wise grandfather the closest member of our most intimate family. They say in India that God is like the sandal tree and the gurus are like the winds that diffuse the perfume throughout the atmosphere. We are intoxicated. Each of us knows him in our own unique way. Each thinks that the Maharaji he knows is the true Maharaji. But he is fooling all of us and seeing his many facets reflected through each other's stories and hearts, we come to know his play, to realize that his identities are infinite, and yet we still thirst to know him, to contain him with our minds. Oh, that we could be to him as Hanuman is said to be to Ram, his very breath. He is our way home. He is the beloved. He is wisdom incarnate. He is grace itself. In these precious moments, there is a suspension of the doubts or disbeliefs born of mind. There is no judgment, only appreciation. The tones of our voices reflect faith, reverence, and wonder. Delight in being privy to the cosmic joke. Discomfiture at our own stupidity. And love so palpable that it is difficult to catch our breath. In these timeless moments when we're together, egos are forgotten. We see it is not so important that he looked at us individually or spoke to us personally. For in relation to him, we are a single we. As he speaks to one of us, he speaks to all of us. So when I examine what creates the depth of my faith that allows me to be in the presence of someone that's dying and be able to balance the breaking of my human heart from my love of that person, my romantic love, my clinging love, and be with the person with such equanimity. When I ask where that faith comes from, 
part of it comes from my direct experiences of transcendent into other states of consciousness through drugs, through meditation, through spiritual practices. Part of it comes from being in the presence of Maharaji, of meeting a being who was what I had touched and was at peace with it. Many of you know that when I got to Maharaji, my main method at that time of getting to taste God was LSD. And I met Maharaji, and he seemed to be like stoned out of his mind. And then he said, what kind of medicine do you use? And I said, LSD. And I brought some, and he took it, and he ate about five doses worth. I mean, enough to put an elephant into nirvana. And then he just, and nothing happened, and he just laughed at me. And his laugh wasn't even hysterical. I mean, I realized then that if you're in Detroit, you don't have to take a bus to Detroit. For him, it was like drinking water. I mean, what was he going to do? You know, where would he go? There was nowhere to go. You take something to go somewhere, but if there's nowhere to go, what are you going to do then? And the presence of that being was part of what my faith was about. And then as I started to read the maps, whether the maps were in, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead or the Upanishads or uh, the Kabbalah or, you know, the Book of Brilliance or something like whatever they were in, or the Gnostic writings or something, Desert Fathers, whatever, Rumi, Hafiz, Kabir, all of this stuff, what I read was a resonance with the truth in myself, and it said, yeah, right. And some combination of my study so that my mind was satisfied at some level to deal with that which is beyond my conceptual mind and not reject it out of hand. And the fact that I had touched my guru and the fact that I had had these experiences has left me with something that I am. It's not a belief system I hold. It's something I am. I just read a a little book called Night by Eli Wiesel, in which he describes being taken away from his village with his family and then separated from his mother and sisters whom he never saw again, his sister. And he was left with his father and they were together in the, the worst concentration camps through hell and hell and hell and hell. And he had been a, a yeshiva student. He had been a, a Talmudic student. And he described getting to the point where he saw the thought process in his mind where he wished his father were dead so that he could have his crust of bread. And that thought was so alien to who he thought he was that everything he thought he held as a belief system was crushed. How could God allow that? And what I have to say is, Every belief system is a concept in the mind, and it must go sooner or later. And what you're left with is what is. And the thing I'm talking about is faith. It's something that is. It's something that you are connected to in your being, that you've acknowledged in your being. And that allows you to withstand the change and the chaos and all of the stuff that's going down. All the work that I have been doing with the dying and learning to have the spaciousness of mind, learning how to be in love and let my heart break and break and break and break and still have inside the emptiness, the spaciousness, the cosmic giggle, and realize that compassion isn't the same as pity or kindness. It's a different thing. It's a profound, profound thing. All of that is bizarrely appropriate to the way I am learning how to deal with our own social, economic, and ecological predicament. One of the interviews I did was with John Seed, who's an ecologist. John is a very beautiful Australian man. He chains himself to trees and things like that, and lies in front of tractors and stuff. And John said, at the rate that the rainforests are being decimated and the implication and the nature of the cultural context in which it's happening, 
I said to John, is there any hope? John said, it would take a miracle to turn it around in time. And he said, but you know, he said, miracles happen. He said, after all, when you look at us, I mean, not so recently we were in the ocean and we came up on land. That was, that was a miracle. He said, with a heredity like that, you know, you can't write us off so quickly. It's all been full of miracles. The whole storyline has been full of miracles. Now that conversation is a very profound conversation. He has a man who knows every statistic about rainforests, and he tells me, no, I don't think it would take a miracle. And I know that as I look not just at the rainforests and the ozone and the global warming and the fish and the oceans and the rivers and the air pollution, And when I look at the increase in violence and the increase in greed and the breakdown of social systems, and when I look at the increasing polarity between the haves and the have-nots and the permanent underclasses and the lack of compassion of human beings for one another, even when I offset it with the emerging democracies and the breakdown of totalitarian systems of one kind and the regulation of nuclear energy, a a realization of the error, the monstrous errors we've been making, even though we don't know what to do with it yet. And when I look at a lot of the beauties of what technology has given us in the way of richer, freer lives, for some of us anyway, all the beauty doesn't offset a deep recognition that we are on a cusp in which the game we've been playing may be crunching to a halt in a more or less chaotic way. That we may be witnessing the death of our own culture. I thought, isn't it bizarre that all of my work with dying people is now my work with a dying culture, of which I am part? Because just as I fall in love with each dying person until it's not her that's dying or him, it's us that's dying. So in the culture, it's us that's going through this transformation. Now, I don't know how it all comes out. I don't know whether, you know, at the last minute, all the cattle are headed for the, you know, in all those Western movies, headed to fall into the ocean. And at some last moment, they all turn because we are the cattle. I feel the incredible inertia in the system. I feel the inertia so deep, not only in the system, but in me. That I am the problem. Oh, I can separate my cans and bottles. But I can't yet let what I now know about the universe fully enter into how I'm living my life. I am living with lack of integrity in my existence. And for me to have integrity means that I won't even know who I will become because I won't be who I am now. And how many people are ready for that? When you see that the changes that are required aren't going to come in the disempowered people, except when they rise up and smite somebody. If the changes are going to be other than violent and chaotic, they must come from the empowered people. But the empowered people are all playing king of the mountain. They're keeping everybody at a distance and buying them off as well as they can. Just to to bring you up to speed on the Seva thing, in around 79, 1979, around the late 70s, as I started to look at the curriculum, I realized that part of the curriculum of being a human on earth had to do with network. It had to do with relationship to other beings. While the spiritual enlightenment path had been me getting enlightened versus it. But now I had to acknowledge that I was part of a family and that led me to take care of my father for 10 years. That was honoring that. And I'm part of a nation state and part of an ecosystem and part of, and I saw that in the 60s, we were so zealous to 
eager to become independent of systems, that there was a way we threw out the baby with a bath a little bit. I mean, I was so busy getting enlightened, I didn't have time for my family. You know, they're a different generation. They don't think like I do. You know, we'd have a couple hundred people in my father's barn, all singing Hare Krishna. My father would come in and said, who is this Hare Krishna and why do you keep repeating yourself? <laughs> and I remember separating, pushing all that away because, you know, your family's the last one you come back to. They, they know how to get you, bring you down every time. You know, I'd stay high with everybody but the family, you know. You go home, you go, they say, you got a job? You know, it's like uh, instant bring down, you know. <laughs> they don't see your beauty, that you're God incarnate. They don't, nah, got a job? Uh, and, you know, when I looked at the society and saw that part of our incarnation meant to honor the web and network, and then I saw that that was known by people but they had been so busy throwing off their primary groups like tribes and family. And then what they ended up doing was forming these surrogate families because of the need. So they go into AA, for example. So suddenly you would have a family, all of whom had your pathology. It was a self-selected family for your pathology. We were all fat together or we're all children of something or we're all... Uh, addicted to achievement or I mean at least in your original family only half the people were drunk now everybody's a drunk so. <laughs> and you bond I mean you bond so that that's family so that everybody that's not an alcoholic you feel they're missing you know they're an ex-alcoholic they're missing having had it and given it up you know So I looked around, I saw that people were choosing surrogate families, and I thought, well, if I'm going to have a surrogate family, what, what kind of family would I like that would help me to grow? And so I found, I was invited into, and I joined a group of people whose intention was, let us come together to see if we can help to relieve suffering. And since we as individuals realize that there are many levels of suffering and that the way to relieve suffering is for yourself to be free of suffering first, we will help relieve suffering of others as a way to work on ourselves to get free of suffering. This is known as karma yoga. We will use the service we do to others as a vehicle to awaken. We are a satsang or a sangha built around compassion. We're going to learn how to be compassion. We're going to surrender into compassion. And for 13 years now, that is what we have done. And incredible projects in Nepal with blind. I mean, there's 50, 70,000 people that have their sight regained every year now because of stuff that Seva does. And Guatemala villagers and refugees and, oh, God, I mean, it's just Native Americans and homeless. And I mean, it's wherever our heart leads us. And it's an incredible joy to be with a group of people that come together around relieving the suffering of other human beings. It's an intentional community because I see that community is where the answer lies. You see, I don't know whether I see it, but you see, when, you, when I say you see, you always should just trust me all the time. because it's What I see at the moment is that between our individuality here and our identity with the unity or the one, one of the roots up the ladder is community, is being with other beings of like mind. It can be satsang or sangha or community of the spirit or whatever. It's a group of people with whom you enter into a contract that allows you to awaken through the relationship. It can be a marriage. It's the yoga of relationship, really. And community is a step because it's a step in which like when I was taking care of my father, I went through the following stages. At first, I took care of my father because I was so righteous. You know, people come up and say, aren't you wonderful taking care of your father? And I'd say, well, somebody has to do it. Can you hear that? Can you hear that milking of it? Then after a while, that one burned out. And then I was doing it as my dharma. Dad, you're my root to God. 
I'm taking care of you in order to get enlightened, you know. Cleaning shit, ah, oh, you know. <laughs> and I was doing my yoga, using my father, stepping over him to get to God. <laughs> then after a while, it got so, we moved to another level where I milked that as far as I could. I mean, I got bored with that trip. Finally, there we were. We were just hanging out together. And I finally had to let my father in as a fellow being. And we were just there together as beings. And it turned out one of us needed this and one of us did this. And there we were together. And we were both growing. And at that moment, I clicked into the feeling that most of you have never turned off, but I had turned off, was the feeling of at-homeness in the family. At home in a very, not a social psychological sense of Richard and the family, that deep sense of being in harmony with the way of things. There was a harmony, a way in which you let yourself in. It's like letting yourself into a warm bath of feeling, yeah, that's right on. That's right on. And those feelings of right onness are what you learn to listen to as you start to ply your way through human incarnation. Because there is no way that what I'm doing is what you should do. You have your unique karmic predicament. You have your unique dharma. One person is bringing a healing to the world through raising children with love and consciousness. Another person is doing it by going to Guatemala. Another person is doing it by licking envelopes for a, a protest. Another person is doing it through writing poetry or art or music. Another person by helping institutions stay alive. Another person by destroying institutions. You cannot lay a trip of saying this is the way you should do it in order to realize your dharma or your truth or your way. There was a long time when I really was so upset about the whole nuclear proliferation, and I wanted to be involved, but I couldn't hear the way to do it that wasn't campy or cute or like, look how good I am. And I, I, it appalled me, so I couldn't do anything. And then I was on tour, and this was a number of years ago, and Allen Ginsberg called me, and he said, I'm supposed to sit with this group at the Rocky Flats demonstration. We're going to sit in meditation in the middle of the whole thing. But he said, I've had illness and I've, in, the, in my family and I've got to be in New York. Would you go and do this? Because I understand I saw your schedule. You're going to be in Boulder. And there was the invitation. I said, I'd love to do it. And that led me to go and sit at Rocky Flats. And when I was sitting there in the rain, in meditation, with all of it going on, there was a place in me that felt right on. I am just at the right place at the right moment doing the right thing. That was harmonious with my being. And I've grown up as a Jew who has been, <laughs> I'm referred to in conservative Judaic circles as the Jew who's led more people away from Judaism in the 20th century in America. Because if you look at almost all the Buddhist <laughs> scenes, there are so many Jews in them. You wonder, are there any Jews left to be Jewish, you know? And the Hindu scenes and so on. So, um, and I've always kind of kept it at a distance. I mean, so this year, around last summer, I guess, I got invited to give an address in Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills, at the University of Judaism, which is the stronghold of conservative Judaism on the West Coast, on Judaism and spirituality. And it was an annual lecture and it was the second annual lecture in honor of this man who had died, who had been murdered, actually. The first lecture had been given by a rabbi from um, Oxford who, on Talmudic studies. And then me. And I thought, oi, I mean, oh, think of oi, you know. <laughs> but you know, it was interesting that, because I often say that when you go on the spiritual journey, the last thing you ever do, the last where you can stay clear is with your family, but the last religious structure you're going to work with is the religion you grew up with because you've developed so many uh, attitudes towards it. But they were inviting me with respect. They weren't inviting me to convert me. They were inviting me with respect, and that made a difference. And I was just about to go off to... Like November and December this year, I spent um, boogie boarding in the South Pacific. Um, 
That may seem peculiar to you, but spiritual practice is a very broad, you know, and <clears throat> being with the ocean is a very mystical experience for me. I don't know how it is for you. And I'm really not into surfing, but I can boogie board. And I, so I, I know it's surfing, but it's different. It's, I mean, I don't mean, I'm not using surfboard. I'm using a boogie board. I lie down. I don't stand. But when you get out there, you know, and everybody's 20 and you're 60, and there's only one place to ride that wave, you know, and they don't make space for you because you're old, you know. You got to take it, you know. Um, quite an art form. Um, so I went to the South Pacific, to um, Tahiti and the Marquesas and places, because I was getting really twisted. I, I mean... I get so righteous that it, it's obnoxious to me. I mean, I get toxically being good. And so I, then I got to go do something, you know, like either I go meditate or I, I went to boogie board. So, so um, I took these Jewish books along to get ready for this lecture. So there I'd be sitting, you know, with these Polynesian women going by, bare-breasted and all that, reading Orthodox Jewish texts you know, about the halakhic rules. <laughs> Some of you will appreciate how humorous that is. And I came back and I gave the lecture, um, I guess the end of January. And there were Hasidic rabbis in the front row and rabbis introducing me. And I really, I'd, I'd read like 15 books and I'd really done my homework. And boy, it was a ball. I had a great time. And in the middle of it, I got that feeling again. This is just right on. Not that I'm becoming, I mean, some people interpret some of the newspaper articles, you know, he finally saw the error of his ways and he's come back. <laughs> they didn't hear a word I said. What I said was, as a method, it's a very beautiful method. And I went through the different forms of the method of the Hasids, of the Orthodox Jews, etc., of Nachman, of Bratslav, and so on. But I, and I said, whether I will practice these particular methods, I don't know. But I'm certainly open to the beauty of this method. One funny aside, I said, as a, when I was reading it, I was seeing all the beautiful techniques for remembering God, and one of them, of course, is the mezuzah you put on the door. So I went out and bought a mezuzah, and I stuck it on my door. You, you touch it or kiss it or... You know, it's, it's got prayers in it that remind you. There are prayers to God. The game is to remember all the time. It's a technique to bring you into this altered state of consciousness so you can start a... All religious traditions are designed to take you from your normal waking consciousness into another state, like a Gothic cathedral or whatever, and then you settle in there, and then you come back, and then you're in it and not in it, nowhere to stand. So they don't concern themselves with the last part because nobody gets out there most part. So I got the mezuzah and I put it in the door and the first day I went out, I kissed it. And the second day I went out, I kissed it. And the third day I forgot. Because that's what happens. Methods work and then you go to sleep. So I stuck a string on the door with a tack so it would hit my forehead so it would remind me that the mezuzah was there to turn. See, and then that works for a while until you just push the string aside to get out, you see. <laughs> By the way, I, uh, I did a, about 150 pages of autobiography around how compassion develops inside myself in this new book, Compassion in Action, which has one of the most revolting pictures on the cover I have ever in my life seen. And I am going to pay the publisher back. You don't have any control over the cover. They put a picture of Mira and I on that looks like, I don't know, it's... It's the kind of people you see in drugstore book racks that you never trust, you know, that kind of people. It's so sleazy. It's airbrushed, and it's all yick. You can tell because I'm smiling, but there's no wrinkles around the eyes. You can always tell a phony smile. <laughs> well, I'll pay for that one. Here are just a couple of quotes to play with. That is perfect. 
This is perfect. Perfect comes from perfect. Take perfect from perfect. The remainder is perfect. When I would get most upset about things in the world, my guru would look at me. Even though he would cry over the sufferings in the world, he would look at me and he'd say, Ramdas, don't you see it's all perfect? Where can you stand that you see that suffering is perfect? Is there a place you could stand? Is there a place you can stand where you can understand without judging the whole system? Where you can allow the possibility that there might be a wisdom inherent in form that you aren't privy to with your analytic mind? If you and I are to be instruments of the healing of the world, it is that we are quiet enough to hear our dharma, our way, and that we live our way as a statement. As Gandhi said, my life is my message. We live our lives in such a way that the way you are in the supermarket, the way you are with your loved ones, the way you are when you're facing pain, it is all part of the deepest wisdom statement you are able to make. It is the truth of your deepest being. For that, you have to listen inward very quietly as you're offering to all beings. that part that isn't judging, that's just appreciating, the paradox you learn to live with is that for your human heart, suffering stinks. And for the deep wisdom truth, the wisdom being that you are, suffering is part of the perfection of it all. When I watch people dying and I see that often their suffering is what finally breaks their ego and opens them, and then at that moment they open. It's like the birth of something so radiantly beautiful that they know that that's who they were all the time, but they had forgotten, and suddenly they're awake to it again. When I have seen that, and I saw it in my stepmother as she died, I've seen it in so many people, am I to say that suffering, that their suffering was just bad? It depends on the nature of the game that's being played. If all of this chaos, ecological chaos and uncertainty and all this economic instability and all of the harshness, in all of it, we must do what we must do to relieve the suffering in whatever way we know, in our anti-nuclear demonstrations, in our voting consciously, in whatever it is we do. But at the same moment, we have to find the place in us where we can be privy to the dance of life and see the grace inherent in all of it. To be able to find that balance, that's the place from which one can act in the world, in a world of change and uncertainty, with equanimity. To act from that space means that you are a, you are a, you are an environment that allows another person to find that place in themselves. When I walk into a room and somebody is dying and everybody around them is panicked about the death, and I come in and I just sit down. It's not that I even do anything. I just sit down. I might hold a hand 
or just smile, or just talk about the pleasantries of the day, or talk about the person's pain. But the vibration, the quality of the being that is doing that, that is, as Meher Baba once said, love is catchy. It's catchy. There's a quality of peace that is transmitted. And if our society is going to be able to deal with the ecological imminence and the economic imminence and the debt structures and the polarizations and the harshness of it all, without going into such a reactive mode that is represented by fundamentalism, by ultranationalism, by this panic and violent pushing against and externalizing the enemy outward as we do in Desert Storm. If we are going to have a history not of violence, but of compassion that will allow a true change, each of us must be a responsible instrument of that, and it's how we live our own lives. It's how I am. It's my own integrity. With my car and with my life and with my everything, with how I spend my money and where I get it and how much I need and how much I really need to be happy and what I do with it and how much I'm caring and how much I turn other people off in order to hold on to my stash. But all of that, once you see the game and you understand your part in it, that being a part of the League of Compassion, if you will, the whole thing becomes your joy instead of your, this horrible giving up something. Gandhi said, when you finally surrender to God, which is the only truth worth having, meaning the formless, I guess, I mean, that's one way of saying it. He said, you find yourself in the service of all that exists. It becomes your joy and recreation. And you never tire of giving yourself. I'm just learning that. I am just learning the joy of being an instrument of compassion in the world. It is our transformation with a secret lies. Just a couple more of these. He who clings to the void and neglects compassion, does not reach the highest stage. But one who practices only compassion does not gain release from the toils of existence. One, however, who is strong in the practice of both remains neither in samsara, meaning form, or nirvana, meaning formlessness. The balance is cultivating the emptiness and cultivating the compassion. Cultivating the quietness of mind so that your ma, your awareness is not clinging to thought and cultivating your love for all things. Being unique and being part of it all. All of these dualities, you embrace them all. You know, it's hard to give you up because you're so sweet. It's so far up. However, isn't it fun to be together? I mean, we just think of I mean, with all of its problems in this culture, it allows us to be like this. It allows us to come together. It allows us to come together to, to share a moment and to reflect about what it's all about. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and ramdas.org 
We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.